Templeton Rye is a, a story uh, from a corporation that's profiting off of a history that doesn't belong to them. Everybody has a right to their history. Everybody has a right to their story. I just like someone not to use my story because you know, how do I tell my story if you've told my story and it's not true? I'm Heath Schneider. I'm the grandson of Lorene Sextro, the famous bootlegger from Templeton, Iowa. For nearly 10,000 years, humans have enjoyed fermenting things into alcohol. Be it beer or moonshine, alcohol is a part of almost every culture. But behind every label, savored in every sip, is a story. Today's alcohol represents generations of distillers, guarded recipes, and so much more than the label may tell. Long before you pop a cork or twist a cap, another story played out. No matter what you drink, there's a story in every bottle. Hi, it's Carell, and welcome to A Story in Every Bottle. Today, we are in my hometown of Las Vegas, Nevada. Today we're going to tell you the story of a bootlegging granny from Iowa, honey, whose history was being appropriated until a feisty grandson from Las Vegas decided to step in and reclaim it. Now, it's a story of survival, it's a story of hope, uh, it's a story of Davy versus Goliath, there's a lot of controversy thrown in, and mostly it's a story of family, Lorene Sextro's family, all around a recipe for a whiskey that Al Capone once called his favorite. It's a story that's not uniquely American when a woman's history is in danger of being appropriated, but that's okay, we found that story right here inside this bottle, because guess what? Like everything you drink, oh, there's a story in every bottle, and it's a good one. You know, I went back to uh, Carroll County, Iowa, heard a story about a guy making my grandmother's recipe. He was speaking of her on his website, and he had her name spelled wrong, so <laughs> I brought it upon myself to go in and explain to him that he had the name spelled wrong and um, wanted to see what my grandma's alleged recipe was like. He was about to find out about his grandmother, Lorene Sextro's very colorful past as a bootlegger, one of Iowa's premier, by the way. She never got caught. And the more he found out, the more he saw that his trailblazing bootleg and granny had a story being taken by a huge corporate giant and or being erased. He made it his mission to tell the story of Loreen Sextro and her legendary Iowa ride. Shide was born in Halber, Iowa. Her parents were Ted and Anna. She was uh, born in 1911. You know, there was a couple of wars in there. And although they were children of immigrants, the Germans weren't especially liked during the 30s because we were in battle with the Germans and some would, were taking uh, that opportunity to describe the uh, making of liquor as being for the Hun because you're using grains that could be fed to soldiers. So it was somewhat of a propaganda method for vilifying German immigrants. You know, it was the Prohibition era that provided the demand for Lorene Sextro's product. And uh, as you can see, Prohibition is still alive and well inside our culture, especially here in the underground at the Mob Museum. But what most of us know is the what of prohibition. Okay, we don't know the why. We know that you couldn't drink, you couldn't buy alcohol, but we don't know why you couldn't. And once we find that out, it proves everything old, unfortunately, is new again, because tropes like immigration, war, racism, radicalism, even the KKK, the anti-saloon squad, they all brought us this dry period in American's history. 
But Lorene Sextro and others took advantage of that to make some money, not so much because they love whiskey, but because they needed money. But she just happened to make some that Al Capone once called his favorite. So to understand the times and to understand how this happens, you have to understand prohibition which means we need a smart person, and we got one. She's the director of education here at the Mob Museum. Her name is Claire White, and she stopped by to fill us in on the 411 on Prohibition. Prohibition was over 100 years in the making, and when people first started pushing for prohibition or, or temperance, which is what the movement was initially called, it was really all about making the United States healthier, wealthier, and safer. And what really pushes the Prohibition Amendment forward is a mixture of xenophobia and, believe it or not, World War I. So during World War I, there's a couple of things at play. First of all, we start pushing to uh, use grain products for food rather than making liquor. And one of the major producers are German Americans. They own almost all of the breweries. And there's also a number of other immigrant groups that are making a lot of money off of liquor. Irish Americans making whiskey and rye and bourbon. Um, a lot of Jewish Americans actually own wineries in the United States at the time. And all of that really does lead to this, this uh, heightened concern over who is making money off of alcohol, who's drinking alcohol, and what that means for the fabric of the United States. The KKK definitely supported prohibition, and they were definitely active in the prohibition movement in the early 1900s. So they are very anti-Catholic, very anti-immigrant at that point, and a lot of the biggest proponents of prohibition do come from that very traditional Protestant faith. Uh, as opposed to a number of Catholics in the United States at the time who are a little more sympathetic to uh, the drinker's cause. Most states that uh, had statewide prohibitions before the federal law had the exact same reasons, uh, but usually it had to do with their demographics. So a lot of the time, uh, you're looking at states where there are specifically large uh, German-American populations, and they are specifically targeting German-Americans and, and trying to uh, make it harder for them to operate their businesses. Iowa is a, is a good example of early prohibition. And in 1915, they decide to overturn the local option and essentially the whole state becomes dry. Uh, it's set to go into effect January 1916. And that's really kind of the beginning of modern prohibition. <laughs> You know, the 18th Amendment was passed and everything was supposed to be dry. The, the Catholics in Templeton and Carroll didn't believe in that. So, you know, prohibition, one of the major goals was to make the United States safer. Uh, safer, healthier, wealthier, and bootlegging really created an environment where the exact opposite is happening. Lorraine and Frank Sextro had to become bootleggers out of necessity. You working, when you're working on a farm and you can't sell eggs, cattle, pigs, you pretty much have the option of selling what people are buying in it. During the Depression, especially in the 30s, people were buying liquor. I also uh, felt that they thought people should have the right to drink if they want to. These were proud Germans making a recipe they were they thought was as good as any recipe out there. I do think Grandma Sextro thought her activities were an act of protest and um, you know peaceful protest. There's a major rise in violent crime, all because of bootleggers. And bootlegging is, is kind of the, the linchpin of why prohibition is the best thing that ever happened to organized crime. And in fact, organized crime to this day, the, the money that they have in their holdings goes all the way back to prohibition. Oh, it was a really tough time when she chose to do it because we were in the heart of the depression. And worse yet, uh, the Germans had just lost the war to the Allies, so, you know, Germans weren't especially liked in Carroll County. So they huddled together in a town of Templeton, kind of ran the town the way they saw fit. And one of the things they saw fit, regardless of what the feds said, was that making liquor was acceptable. <laughs> Do I feed my children or versus do I make whiskey? I don't think it was a gangster thing so much as a, 
this is what I need to do to feed my kids thing, which is even more admirable in my mind because, you know, I know my grandmother was a very religious person. I know she was uh, very committed to her ideas and her values. So for her to choose to make whiskey in 1932 during the Depression had to be hard times. Truly, you can thank the Great Depression for the end of Prohibition. And in fact, uh, the, the Depression sort of creates this perfect storm of why we need alcohol again. There's a lot of people who are feeling down on their luck feeling like they need a little boost. And there is definitely a, a job benefit. You know, it's really easy to say if we bring back liquor, we'll bring back brewers' jobs and distillers' jobs and, and jobs in bars. But you're also bringing back major uh, transportation industries. You're bringing back truckers. You're bringing back people who are making bottles and making uh, casks and making kegs. These are all jobs that we essentially lose during Prohibition. And not only do we lose them, but the people who sort of fill in those niches are not paying taxes because they're doing it illegally. And so all of these things sort of create a world in which we need liquor to come back in order to at least partially help us out of the Great Depression. Okay, so now we know two things. We know that racism and anti-immigrant sentiments aren't new, <laughs> and how the demand for bootleg alcohol came to be. It was as much the politics of hate that made America dry out as a need for us to be healthier. So how did a mother and a wife and a grandmother get involved and end up being one of the few to never get caught? What was the secret to her recipe that made it so good that they clamored for it and why was it so popular that even today people would like to appropriate it for themselves? To understand that part, we have to understand who Lorene Sextra was, and that means we gotta talk about family, because that's who Lorene Sextra was. You know, the family worked hard. That was what everyone did during that time, and my grandmother, Lorene Ashied, was farmed out to other families to help as a midwife when other women would have children after eighth grade. Lorene's from a big family. She has 10 siblings. When you have 11 children, the first child doesn't necessarily know the 11th child as well as one would think. Lorene and Frank Sextro were married in 1931, and they lived uh, two miles east of Templeton, Iowa, on a farm that Frank, my grandfather's father, bought and shared with his three children. Lorraine had seven kids. My mom was in the middle, uh, kind of the second wave of children. So Grandpa and Grandma Sextro had no heating, had no electricity, had no plumbing, unless you consider a three-holer plumbing, and um, that was the life they led. They did have a still, and it was the one way they could make money the one way they could, they could make a living during the Depression. Frank and Lorene always worked. You know, I think the liquor was more of a side hustle than it was their main hustle. Their main work was farming. Their main work was maintaining um, the farm. And I know later in their life they got into the restaurant business and the bar business, but at the time that they were making whiskey, they were a newlywed couple. My grandmother had Aunt Shirley in her, in her belly, and she's walking lunch out to a bootlegger who's making 300 gallons a night on her farm so that they can get 75 cents a gallon. And that's just enough to Everybody gets Christmas boots and Christmas pants and Christmas socks. You know, it's, they weren't gangsters. And I, I'm pretty sure afterwards she uh, just went back to work. You know, when one could make a regular living or get a job or find a way to feed your kids, she went back to work. Lorene Sextro was a disruptor in the 1930s. She drove a car. Women didn't drive cars. Uh, she took leadership roles in the church. Um, in the Democratic Party. Um, she was involved in her community and she loved watching her 31 grandchildren, you know, uh, out playing sports. She'd attend all of our games and, or, you know, the best of her ability. So 
very active woman. Even in her 90s, my grandmother Loreen would drive her Galaxy 500 about 80 to 90 miles an hour down the back roads of Iowa going to bingo. And it's just the way she was, you know, she's, she's just full of piss and vinegar sometimes. Lorraine always kept on trucking, you know, they're just, she'd never let grass grow under her feet. She always needed something to do. I honestly think that's why she taught the Eggers family how to make whiskey is because she was proud of the fact that she made whiskey. She thought she made a really good whiskey. Most people told her it was unparalleled. Grandma Sextro is laid to rest in the Templeton Cemetery at the Sextro plot. There's quite a few Sextros in the Templeton Cemetery and uh, she wouldn't have it any other way. I I'd go to Templeton and visit her any chance I get. <music> Grandma Sextro loved life. Uh, she really felt like you're, you made your own luck. She lived a life that she felt was well thought out and proper and always tried to do right by everybody. So this bottle right here, this little bottle, contains all that history and all of those stories, as well as some damn good whiskey <laughs> up in there. It also contains a good deal of controversy, because after he connected with the people that were going to revitalize his grandmother's legacy, he soon found out that there were others outside the family, cue the bad music here, uh, 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 that were quick to appropriate the Templeton and Grandma Sextro's story for themselves. So let's take a look first at the actual product. What's inside the bottle? What is this recipe? And how are they making it now versus how are they making it then? And then let's address that controversy. I'm very proud of Sextro Rye, Iowa Legendary Rye, and Sextro Vodka in that it follows my grandmother's recipe to a T. We've won 21 international spirits competitions with that recipe. Grandma Sextra was a fantastic cook, a heck of a baker, and understood yeast as well as anybody has ever experimented with and you know, spent a lifetime working with yeast. Her yeast experience was more with bread. She'd make 12 loaves of bread every Sunday and it would be made to last the entire week. But when you make bread you know, 12 loaves at a time every Sunday for a very long period of time, you become very experienced with yeast. So she knew how to use yeast, and many don't know that making bread and making whiskey are quite similar. A Templeton rye was made with four ingredients, and only four ingredients, and that is water, sugar, 100% rye, and yeast. And that is exactly the way that Templeton rye was made. It's exactly how it should be made if you're gonna claim that history. The town of Templeton, 400 people then, 400 people today used three boxcars of sugar regularly. Mind you, a town of 400 people because sugar was the main ingredient to make rye that made the town of Templeton famous. And Whiskey Rich told me that his family sought out my grandmother with her being one of the original gangsters, for lack of a better word, you know, knowing the original recipe his family sought that from my grandmother because it was so good and it was so, such a legend in the area. And we talked about that a little bit, the uniqueness of her processes. Many of these processes, patent pending, um, that make a natural, non-enzyme, pure spirit that I believe to be unparalleled. The many use 40 and 50 and 60 gallon uh, barrels. And um, when Rich's family, you know, Whiskey Rich here, uh, his family interviewed my grandma in her 90s. They brought a recipe that they thought, thought was accurate to the whiskey being manufactured in Templeton, Iowa. And there's four or five, six recipes out there. And uh, my grandma took their recipe and just started putting lines, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And one of the things they had wrong that she was adamant about is they had a 40 gallon barrels, but we will always be 15 gallon drum. 
and everything is era specific and it will always be era specific because we believe there's magic in that formula. So it was Grandma Lorene's uniquely homegrown yeast as well as sugar, locally grown rye and local water combined with a small batch brewing process that made her rye so unique. So unique in fact that others want to claim their heritage and the recipe. And while Heath and Whiskey Rich acknowledged that there were other recipes, one corporate giant decided to claim the name Templeton Rye and pretty much co-op the story of the hardworking farmer bootlegging to survive while making the good stuff as it became known. And while Heath may be all for sharing the legacy of Templeton during Prohibition, he wasn't about to let a large corporate giant take Lorene and Templeton's story with a product that was nothing like the original. And it wasn't just Heath with an issue, as the brand Templeton Rye had to settle litigation about deceptive trade practices surrounding their story or lack of authenticity thereof. It's a feud that Capone himself would love and one Heath continually fights. Templeton Rye paid a $5 million lawsuit for deceptive trade practice. It's because they were claiming the story I'm telling you today. Unfortunately, it's not their story. It's a great story. And I'm not saying that the family involved with telling the story isn't somewhat adjacent to the story, but the real recipe, the real story, the real deal is what we do. And history books prove that. Templeton Rye has stolen a piece of history from my family. I would estimate it at eight to 10 families that created a piece of American history in 1920 to 1932. My family is one of those families. I don't have a, a waking moment where I don't feel like it's unjust, it's not fair. And at the least, people should know that if they want to try Templeton Rye from 1932, that they are not trying it when they try the brand Templeton Rye. So the product, Templeton Rye, says it's just another story, another recipe from the era, and that they are a true Prohibition-style product. After the deceptive trade practice lawsuit, the company put out a video to explain their side and to remind people that they're telling their own story, a grandfather's story, and sharing a grandfather's recipe, much like Heath shares Grandma Sextro's with Sextro Rye and Iowa Legendary Rye. But after listening to the explanation, one could be left with more questions than answers. Are they or are they not sugar, rye, yeast, and water, the OG recipe from the area? Or... Are they appropriating someone else's recipe and story? Well, it depends on who you ask. Hi, I'm Keith Kirkhoff, and I'm here today to answer some questions that our customers may have surrounding the recent news stories about Templeton Rye. Templeton Rye is a family secret, and it also is a trade secret for us here at Templeton Rye today. My grandfather was involved in Templeton Rye during Prohibition. Uh, my grandfather had passed down the recipe to my dad and consequently I ended up with it. And uh, so we had a bottle of my grandfather's whiskey and technically to be a rye whiskey, you gotta be at least 51% rye, aged no less than two years in new oak barrels. Well, my grandfather's recipe wouldn't qualify because it was not 51% rye. So we took the whiskey and sent it down to a, a whiskey engineer in Louisville, Kentucky. He provided a formulation that we could add to that whiskey and it would made it very comparable to Alphonse Kirkhoff's whiskey. I'm as confused as anyone on that explanation, but I can tell you this with absolute fact. They buy a 95% rye product from MGP in Indiana. They openly admit this. Their distilling partner and then a flavoring partner, which is a chemical laboratory out of Kentucky, that allegedly tries to make it taste like something that harkens back to the original recipe. I have a problem with all of that. It's 100% deceptive. And the fact is that the only person who can make a recipe like Templeton Rye in 1932 
is going to have to use water, sugar, rye, and yeast. So he can't even tell his grandfather's story because he's latched on to another story that has nothing to do with what his grandfather did. The product you drink today as Templin Rye is the same product that we used when we originally started the company. That is true. That's about the only truth that this entire video has shared. Mr. Kirkhoff just proved exactly what I've been stating from the beginning, and that this has nothing to do with the original story, the original recipe. And the reason he has to say it this way is because that's the only marketing they have. Without the story, they don't have a product to sell. So they're somehow trying to latch themselves onto the history and the story and the, and the, and, and the romance involved with a bootlegging farmer making liquor that became world famous. They're hitching their wagon to that. That's what sold this MGP product. So you can't unhitch your wagon from that advertisement because now you're just another whiskey that comes from MGP. My grandmother's recipe is the only recipe that's being made that's accurate to that time and place. The only surviving recipe. Just tell the truth and admit that Templeton rye during Prohibition was made with water, sugar, rye, and yeast, and that in all honesty, other than telling the story, they have nothing to do with the story. That's what they should do. It's the right thing to do. And anybody who watches this video should recognize that. Because here's the fact. If a person wants to try Templeton rye from that time and place, it has nothing to do with the juice they're putting in that bottle. There is a product that does fulfill that need, and God knows they've sold millions of bottles telling that story, but I think their consumers, and I think the consumer in general, and Iowans in general, have a right to know the truth, and if they truly want to try that, that recipe from that time and that place, they should know that it is not Templeton Rock. Since the release of the Kirkhoff video and lawsuit settlements, Templeton Rye, the brand, in their own words, has moved on, particularly in their marketing. They have opened a distillery and museum in Templeton, Iowa, and according to a representative, while none of their current in-market product is distilled there, they say that will change in 2023 and beyond. The representative also said that their product is inspired by the prohibition flavors and recipes, but that their recipe is not, in fact, made the exact same way with the same ingredients and distilled the same way as Grandfather Kirchhoff's, that it's been updated with additives for flavor. So he's contention that what's inside the Templeton Rye bottle is not the original recipe made the original way would appear to be correct with the difference now being that the company doesn't say that it is, it simply says it's inspired by it. It's, it's very personal. I mean, I'd ask anyone who watches this to ask themselves, how would you feel if your family was part was part of American history, you know, a, a very interesting part of American history, and somebody else is telling that story. The record is that I have a family that represents the only surviving recipe for that time and that place, and that particular liquid, that liquor product was famous in the region and was Al Capone's favorite whiskey. It was the whiskey he gave to his friends because it was the good stuff. took your history back, you know? I took your history back. I put you back in the history book the way you should have been in the first place, the way all those other families should be. And there are books written about these people, but uh, the story being told today is complete baloney. And I cannot, as a good grandson, allow baloney to take my family's history. So I'm out here fighting for your history and I hope you're proud of your grandson. Oh my God, Lorene Sextra, what a story. Really, what a story. I mean, that's a lot to take in all around some whiskey, right? Lorene Sextra's legacy is now safe in the hands of Heath Schneider, her grandson. Uh, and he's letting the world know 
that this simple but very unique way of making rye nearly a hundred years later is still the best way to do it. Now, no matter what you drink, I want you to do it responsibly. And remember, every time you open up a bottle, you're not just having a drink, you're reliving a story, a history, a legacy, a real story in every bottle.